Okay, ladies and gentlemen, I'm here with Leray Freaker, the uh, preeminent family historian who has written uh, Find Your Actual Factual Ancestors, A Genealogy Journey in Eight Steps. And um, so we're, that, that book is the one that you can get the first uh, five chapters for free. So you just go to freefamilyhistorybook.com and you can get the first five chapters for free. For a small donation, only $9.99, you get the complete book. It's, it's full color, charts, maps, uh, links to everything. Um, it's a nice uh, PDF file, so it's compact and um, very t technologically friendly, I'd say. So today, you know, uh, as, as this is uh, you know, Memorial Day weekend, uh, Leray's going to talk to us a little bit about uh, Memorial Day and uh, those kinds of records. Uh, are we talking about war records, Leray? Yes, yes. We'll talk about military records today and all the, well, not all, but um, many of the ways we can connect into them. So let's start off with a story. And, of course, I w was raised with family stories, and I recommend that everyone tell their true events to their children and their grandchildren so that they connect to the world and to the, their families and to history. And so I want to tell just a, a really brief story. I was born the end of 1944. About six weeks after I was born, my uncle, Leroy Wadsworth, was fighting in France in the Battle of the Bulge. He was a scout, and he was sent ahead. He stood up and waved his arm as a signal to the rest of his comrades. And he was killed by a German bullet. And it was a long time before his body was found. And I've got a really fabulous story to tell you about that. Because it's my first memory. I was 11 months old. And so if you think little tiny children can't remember things, it's not true. And this is what I remember. I remember being up in the air as though I was being held in someone's arms. And I was looking down at what I now know was a casket. Of course, I was a baby. I wasn't even a year old, so I didn't know it was a casket at the time. But the casket was there in my grandmother's living room. And that memory stayed with me and would come to me from time to time. Finally, when I was in my mid-30s, I sent my mom and dad and said, I have this memory. I know I was in Grandma's living room. I know I was up in the air as though I was being held in someone's arms. And I know I was looking down at this box that I now know is a coffin. Could that have actually happened? And of course, my mom and dad said, well, of course. That would be Uncle Roy's coffin. And the only thing in it would be the bones that were left from his death. Because by the time I was 11 months old, Uncle Roy would have been dead for a year or so. You do the math. And so Uncle Roy has always been really important to me, even though I never met him that he knew I was born, the first grandchild in the family, is evidenced because he sent a little tiny congratulations card through the Air Force's mail to my mom and dad. And I have that little tiny card. Of course, the paper was very expensive, and so all the communications in very small pieces are that time. But I have never forgotten that connection that I have with my Uncle Roy, whom I never met. And 
And my heart is full today because it's the day before Memorial Day. For all the great men and women who have done so much for us that we can vote and we can say what we want to say and we can move around freely. Um, we still have so many freedoms. You're kind of going kind of soft. Can you get a little bit louder? Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. So yeah, you, you're you saying that we can vote, and then what? We can vote. We can move from place to place without having a document, that, you know, filled out that says we can move. Um, we can change jobs. We can go to schools we want to go to. Hey, now, I wanted to go back on Uncle Roy because... Um, I wanted to, to to ask you something about that. Um, that was in, he just appeared in January 1945, from what I remember you teaching me. Yes. His bones were recovered and returned in November of 1945? Uh, probably more like October. Okay, that was the Battle of the Bulge. This is Uncle Roy Free? Would this be a free? Uh, no, this is Watsworth. This Roy is Uncle Roy Watsworth. My okay. mother's brother. So, so was this John's older brother? Oh yes. Okay. All right. Now, in in now he was. I know he was the leader of a, a group of soldiers of infantry. What, do we know what uh, rank? He was, a, he was a sergeant. Okay, and he was near the. He advanced near the German lines for this charge. Now, in in one version, I just wanted to double check this because this is good. It's a good example because in one version I heard that he was mistaken for a German when he stood up and he was shot from behind by a different military unit by friendly fire. Okay, now, and that is a good thing for you to say because what we actually have found out, and this is something that all people who have any kind of military connections can investigate. There is a book about the unit that he belonged to. And the memories of those who lived and the leaders of, of his um, units wrote a history. And most, most units did that. And so I now have, and you know something, David? This didn't come to us until just within the last decade. And a man who was one of the authors of this book sent these pages to our aunt the sister of my mother and of Uncle Roy. And so we actually have the story of how he died from this book. And this is the, one of the things that I wanted to tell our listeners is that whatever unit your ancestor or even you were in, there will almost certainly be a narrative history and you can find it. And one of the places where many of those books are warehoused is in the Military Museum down in Palm Springs, California. And of course, there are other places as well. You could go online and find the histories of your books. You can go on to Ancestry.com and many of those histories are available there. So now we know because of this new military history that he was shot by Germans. That's right. And uh, just to make extra sure, I copied those pages and sent them to my brother, who also has a bit of a military background. And I sent the page before and I sent the page after all the mentions of our Uncle Roy. And I had him read it to make sure that the language that was used in that indicated uh, that it was a German bullet. And that's what he said. And so this family legend, if you will, that had occurred in our family was now shown to be incorrect. And isn't that wonderful? And that's how genealogy works. As we learn more, and find out more, we're able to correct misconceptions and get the true history of our family. Okay, now what if it had happened the other way around? What if we had found out that Uncle Roy had been killed 
by friendly fire. You know that happened. It's just, especially it happened in um, the Civil War. Well, yes. I mean, that's what it what it does is it helps to dis, dissolve the uh, glamour of uh, of war. It does, and the mythology of war because. A lot of times people are killed on accident. There are lots of accidents that occur in combat. A lot of them. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't mean they're not heroes. Oh, not at all. It, it, in fact, what it helps us to realize is, is okay, should I jump into this war? Should, uh, because, because if you're going to go serve as your ancestors did, you need to be aware of all the risks that are involved. That's right, and you certainly know that. Yeah, From well, military background. yes, and a lot, of, and and you know, uh, I learned that you can be injured in combat training, and and then you're done. <laughs> yeah, you know, absolutely. Uh, I didn't realize how many careers end in the military until my own did, as a result of just a you know injury in in the line of duty in training, and uh, right, I, and that mm -hmm. does not make you less heroic either. Well, well, I appreciate that. You know, it is what it is. We live and we move on. I am holding in my hand my journal with my entry from May 25th, 2008, when you first told me about Uncle Roy and a list of other relatives. Because we've done our genealogy, we know about who have, and this is one of my sacred genealogy or, or journal entries, and I noted the correction that you just gave me in the story of Roy. And I've got lists of all of the uh, relatives that served and were in their patriotic service. Um, because we've done our family history, you uh, or someone has uncovered that John and David Pulsifer, um, who would be my sixth and fifth, uh, well, it's, uh, David and John Pulsifer would be my sixth and fifth great grandfathers, fought at the Battle of Bunker Hill. Yes. Absolutely. And we have relatives who fought in the Black Hawk War, we have relatives from the Civil War, and you know that Uncle Bruce fought in the Korean War. Yep. Uncle Uncle John was in Berlin in the 1960s when the wall went up. What, was he, um, he, so Uncle John Wadsworth, he served also? Oh, absolutely. So we're talking about Margaret's husband? We are. I didn't know that. And Grandpa Kerr was what is called a Cold War vet because he was born in the 1930s, and so he was between the First and Second Wars. He wasn't quite old. I mean, the Second War in Vietnam. And, of course, Uncle Nick was in Vietnam. My first cousin Albert was in Vietnam. We have, our family is, very well represented. We have cousins right now who are serving in the military. And yeah, I'm Mike, really careful Mike. Mm -hmm. about naming living people. Okay. I don't think that's appropriate. Okay. But we, we definitely have uh, several cousins who are in the military right now and serving with distinction. So... You are absolutely right, and I really want to make that point, the one that you made. We would not know of our honorable, sacrificing, and wonderful ancestors if we had not researched them. Yeah, let me, let me throw out a couple other names, just in case okay. they're listening. Uh, James Henry Rollins. Yes. Uh, of people who, well, this name served in different ways. Uh, I've got William Rollins, Ichabod Downing, yes. Obadiah Johnson, Josiah Rogers. Um, you gave me oh, one of the... Uh -huh. Revolutionary War people. Is that right? Okay, those are all Revolutionary War. And then I've got this one, Keziah Ketura, Van... Huh? Van Ben Tyson. Van Ben Tyson. Um, she is a woman... Mm -hmm. But there are some women who, um, because of nursing or supplies, or a few even actually fought, who are in the Daughters of the American Revolution list, 
Go ahead. James Henry Wheeler, um, great grand uncle Jimmy, World War One, brown eyes, right. black hair, Nevada corporal, 362nd Infantry, 92nd Division, I think. Yeah. Um, Thomas Fairchild. Yes, and he would be Revolutionary War also. Okay, that belongs back in Revolutionary. Okay. Um, and then we had Uncle Nick's father. Uh, Uncle Nick, what was his name? That would be uh, Albert Smith. So, Albert was Smith. A, a military, he was a career military man. And he was in that um, Hell on Wheels, uh, really famous um, military unit. Um, so anyway, that and then um, Albert Free, you said Vietnam. Uh, Uncle Nick himself was Vietnam. Um, and then and then there was other things that we ta other other people we talked about that were just important. And this is important on Memorial Day that you know um, we have all these war veterans, but then there's a lot of people that didn't serve that uh, were really important. Um, you you would mention some, uh, like uh, Abram Evans, a handcart pioneer. Mm -hmm. um, Edward Bunker, a miner. Mm -hmm. Well, and my own father in World War II, which would have been the war he was the right age for. He and his family were miners. They were in what was considered essential industries. So they were re uh, supplying raw materials for the war effort. So there were many ways that people could serve. And, and they did. Well, and everybody who went and served had a family back here supporting them, you know? That's right. That's right. Uh huh. So so we're celebrating the sacrifice of the of the mothers and grandmothers and brothers and sisters and um, children. All the sacrifices people made in their service. I, I mean, this journal entry uh, changed my life. That when you sat down and we had this discussion four years ago, uh, it was life changing for me. And so I still, I come back to this on a regular basis. That is really exciting. So you're telling me that this research I've done is actually counting for something in your own life. Yeah, um, absolutely. Yeah. And, and, then okay. the, uh -huh, and then, you know, the other side of it is on the Dutch side of the family we had... Um, Simone and Andres that lived in the uh, in Holland uh, when the Nazis occupied it. Yes. And, yes. and so Memorial, yes. Memorial Day is a good day to remember the people that suffered under tyranny. That's true. Fascism. And, and that is one of the, thank you for bringing these things up because those are all points that I really wanted to make. We're talking about uh, primarily the United States but there are people in all countries who are in their, their own militaries, and there are records of those people. And so, no matter where you live, there will be records kept about your people who were in your militaries. And there are, oh, you know, your great-grandpa, I mean, your grandpa, Andrews, Vanderbeek. They lived there in The Hague during World War II. And the stories of how Grandpa had to hide in the old empty oil tankers so that he could escape being conscripted uh, by the Germans and, and they had no food. Um, their heroes right and left. And didn't uh, they have to eat things like potato pills and tulip bulbs? Oh, absolutely. absolutely. And, and, um, and Grandma said that she missed the most, the thing she missed the most was soap. That's right. And they wouldn't talk about these things, by the way. No, we had to really ask, didn't we? 
Um, I remember Grandma talking once and just breaking down, sobbing. Yep. Yep. Um, and, and Grandpa would never show any emotion. Yep. Uh, you know, except anger. He was, you know, I, and I can understand that, you know, look, looking back and, um, and that she weighed 95 pounds at the end. And she's just told me she's, she was 5'10". And she's 5'10", and she was pregnant. Yep, and she just, and no food for the baby, no soap to wash the diapers. And yet, and yet they made it. And they and eventually crossed the plains in a Greyhound bus <laughs> and came to Idaho. So yeah, they had to immigrate, and, and they had to immigrate legally, and they had and they couldn't just come over here. They had to have a sponsor. That's true. You couldn't just come, show up in the United States even. You had to have somebody here who was willing to sponsor you and, and help you get established. That's right. Help you get a job and, and maybe even help you learn the language and all of that kind of thing. So, A lesson so. of history of how actually immigration can work, you know. Yeah. And how it should work. And uh, so the people on both sides are heroes. The soldiers who ultimately liberated the Netherlands, um, the people from all over the world who supplied food and clothing to them after the war was over. And Andy and, and Simone would be examples of people who refused to serve the... Uh, the they would be examples of people who refused to serve the Nazi war machine because weren't they trying to get them to force them to work in factories? Is that what they were? Oh, they did. They did. Like I said, Grandpa, when when the word came that the Nazis were coming to collect the Dutch men to work for them, he would hide. He would go in an underground, empty oil tanker. Um, uh, he may have hid, hidden in other places, but that is the one place that I know about. And also, somebody caught him at one point, and he had to shove the guy into a canal. Do you remember that? Isn't that something? Uh, some Nazi, you know, probably some Stasi stooge, you know? Yep. You, you remember that? I don't actually remember that story, but you... Well, Dad, I think Dad probably told that one. The other one he told me is about the Dutchmen not having an army or any weapons. Yeah. And so the, the, that in, in some villages they had just tried to use medieval medieval armor and, and, oh, yeah. and medieval weapons to fight. And, I, and that's a story. See, this is what the thing about this genealogy is that that story of, them, of those men, you never see that. I've never seen a movie about that. No, no. That's, you know, you know my quote this, um, about the history of the world is not complete until it includes your history. Yeah. There is a there is a true event, or maybe many true events, for every single person who ever lived through World War Two, and we will never understand all of World War Two until those stories are written. And the same is true with our lives right now. And I want to say, I hope I can remember. I should have been uh, taking notes, but I'm so interested in what we're saying here. Uh, okay, first of all, when it comes to genealogical research, what your background is just simply doesn't, doesn't matter in that one story is better than another or that one lineage is better than another. There may be people with German heritage who are listening to this, and it doesn't matter whether they were for Nazis or against them. At this point, what we would like to recommend is that you find out, and then you have your own true events that you can say, my great-great-grandpa was a hero or I wish my great-great-grandpa had done something differently. Because I can promise you that every one of us has relatives 
or whom we can say, I wish they had done that differently. We say that about our own lives. But here's the key. When we know stories of our ancestors, it helps us make decisions about our own lives. So if we know that Grandma and Grandpa Vanderbeek were able to avoid being conscripted by the enemy during World War II, and they were able to survive those horrible things, then it gives us the courage to make similar choices, right? Well, absolutely. I mean, again, we can't compart com you know, categorize people as universally evil. There were so many good German people in World War II that right. did not support the Nazis. You know, how many people were like Ir General Rommel that uh, refused to carry out orders, but he was a noble general, well respected, did everything. Uh, and and how many how many German men were like that that were serving their country, but would not participate in these atrocities? It was only a minority of uh, of, of people that participated in the atrocities. Exactly. Well, and look at Grandpa Kerr. He had great uncles or great great uncles who were who fought on the north in the Civil War, and he had some who fought in the south, fought for the south in the Civil War. We haven't yet been able to determine if they actually faced each other because we're not sure which battles they were in yet, which brings me back to the next point. We can look at their war records, and then we can go to the histories of the units they were in, many of which are online at Ancestry.com, and many of which are published in books that we can find in the military libraries. We can actually find that out if that is something we, we would like to know. So, the military, and, and even though there have been fires, uh, for example, in the facility there near Kansas City, there was a big fire in the military records there. So, some of the records have been lost, but there will be other ones. So, finding the military records of our ancestors is important for so many reasons. And one of the things that I want to mention is that the pension records for those people who served and for their families are absolute gold mines of family information. In order to get pensions, especially in the earlier days, people would rip out pages of their Bibles and send them uh, to the administrators, and those Bible records will be in the file, or they will have gone around to their neighbors and had them write had them write letters that say something like this: "I was in this unit of this state, and this man served with me, and his wife is, and his children are, and you." So you will find letters written by neighbors about that family who served in the diff different wars and in the different military branches. I have, back in the old days, when I had to write for the pension records, I had them copy them, and of course I paid for them, and I have them here in my file. And they list the wife, they list the children, they give the birth dates and places, Sometimes they will give grandchildren. So when you look at your family, in fact, I would really like to encourage everyone who might be listening to find out about your military people, maybe in time for next Memorial Day, so that you know if you have any ancestors in any country who served in any military, and then find out the histories of their units, and then get copies of the pension papers. It will, just like you, you told me about that conversation we had four years ago, and I, I want you to tell me a little bit more about that, but we've touched on so many important things that I wanted to encourage people to go ahead and do this 
and then share these true events with the family members. Yeah. Um, yes, in closing, um, we need to get out there. Genealogy and family history is just beginning, and this is a great conversation to exemplify the 3D nature of, of genealogy and how it can come into your life and have an impact on you that, you know, changes your life for the better. Um, so you got to, in order to do these things, you're going to have to learn how to do family history, and that's what the book is all about. So uh, the book is Find Your Actual Factual Ancestors, A Genealogy Journey in Eight Steps. And you just go to freefamilyhistorybook.com, freefamilyhistorybook.com. You download the first five chapters, you look at it, you realize that this is the great book, and it will help you. You go, you, you get the book, you work through it, and then you start watching these videos in this series, and you submit questions, and we will address them. Uh, people are downloading it every day, and... Uh, and so there, there, people are on this journey. Why not you? Why not do something to, to make your life better, to make the lives of your children and your relatives better? Why not? I mean, it's, it's, a, it's just a no-brainer for, for us at this point. And, and so we want everybody to participate this, in this uh, great uh, journey, as the book says. And when it's time, if you've downloaded the free part, it's only nine ninety nine to have the whole book in your hands. You know. Or in your hands uh, on your screen, right? Okay, that's true. Uh, yeah, because it's a great digital file, and that, and what the what why that's important is because it has all the links in it that are active, so that you can go and click on the links and go to the resources because uh, the power of the internet and um, so. So that's the book. Uh, thank you, Larray, for all of your wisdom and, and work and service. And, and, and we thank all of you out there and the service men and women in your families and all of your sacrifices that make it possible for us to do this program and have the freedom and the, and the luxury and the comfort to be able to do this and put this information out there. Thank you. Thank you. Mm-hmm. I love you, by the way. <laughs> love you too, Mom. <laughs>